Imran had a 100% scholarship. Hi guys, today I have a very special guest with me who is a friend from college, Imran Salim and he is in San Francisco for about a week so I thought maybe I should make a video with him uh, where he can share his journey all the way from Bangladesh to the United States and that's also the reason I am making this video in English. Uh, Imran Bhai speaks very good Hindi but not everyone in Bangladesh can understand or speak Hindi so I thought it's better to make it in English. So welcome Imran to my channel and San Francisco. Thanks Rishabh uh, for uh, inviting me uh, for the interview at your channel and I'm really glad to be here. First of all like what brings you to San Francisco? Uh, so I uh, came here to attend a conference it's called Open Data Science Conference it's a very uh, famous and popular conference among data scientists and it's going to be happening here in San Francisco and I will also thought that I'll visit my good friend Rishabh and explore the city of San Francisco for a few days. And it was absolutely fun. Uh, showing him run all the famous spots here in San Francisco and I hope you have a good time in this conference. So Imran, first of all, uh, I would like to know your journey basically. Uh, how was it growing up in Bangladesh? Because most of my viewers, they are from India. So they would be interested in knowing where are you from and later on we can move on to your professional journey. Uh well, I am from uh, Chittagong. It's a coastal uh, city in Bangladesh, in southern region. And I was born and grew up there and I studied there till my 10th grade. And for 11th and 12th, I moved to the capital, Dhaka. And then uh, I did my undergrad and worked there until I came to US. I already knew about this place since uh, there is a very big cricket stadium in Chittagong, if I am not wrong. And I still remember watching India versus Bangladesh matches uh, in Chittagong, Dhaka and Mirpur. I think those are the three major ones over there. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, nowadays, I think there are a few more. Uh, but I remember I went to Chittagong Cricket Stadium once, uh, even before Bangladesh got the test status. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was fun to go there and watch cricket. I have never watched a cricket live in a stadium, so must have been very exciting for you. So now let's move towards your professional journey. So what made you to decide to do a master's degree here in the United States? Uh, well, I did my undergrad in business administration and my major was marketing. And when I was uh, in my final year, I thought that I would go abroad to pursue uh, my MBA or master's. And that's one of the reasons I decided not to continue to the MBA program while most of my classmates actually uh, after their undergrad, they directly enrolled into the MBA program and finished that MBA in one year. But I rather decided I wanted to work and gain some work experience before I apply for my master's program. After my undergrad, I joined MetLife as a management trainee and worked there for three years until I came to US. And when I was working there, I saw senior managers and senior leaders. Uh, they would have... Uh, MBA or other master's degree from uh, US or Canada or Australia and that also actually uh, encouraged me to pursue my MBA or higher studies in US. Uh, one thing I would like to know is how common is it for a student in Bangladesh to pursue higher education abroad for example in United States, Australia or Canada? I think it's uh, very common among uh, science and engineering students, but it's a little less common among business students. But I think now the trend is changing. Now I see more and more students from business background coming to US to pursue higher studies. But when I was applying five years back, there were fewer students and the trend is definitely changing. And I think that's a very good sign. And that is really good because most of my friends who came here as a student uh, I would say I, almost all of them, they have an engineering degree. So it's good to have people from different backgrounds. My next question is uh, about the visa process. So uh, in India, it's fairly easy to get the visa. And when we spoke earlier in college, you said that in Bangladesh, it's not that easy. So can you throw some more light on the visa process and did you face any difficulty in getting the visa? So when I say it's a little difficult to get the visa, what I meant is that it's not very common among students in Bangladesh to get a student loan and use that loan to apply for visa while I see lots of my classmates and even you had taken a student loan to fund, fund your studies. And 
in Bangladesh, the trend is more like getting full funding or full scholarship and then apply for visa. And then that makes uh, the process a little bit easier and you are a little less scrutinized and you have more likelihood of getting a visa. While if you apply from self-funding, it's a little bit more difficult and you are uh, scrutinized a little bit more and there are chances of uh, getting rejected, but it's not does not mean that it's not possible. And it makes sense because if you have an education loan, so bank must have basically verified your background. So my next question is about the scholarship part. Uh, so guys, Imran had a 100% scholarship. So maybe you can share how you basically shortlisted the universities. When I was looking into colleges, there was a list of 1000 colleges. But how do I choose the ones that basically provides you 100% funding or scholarship? Well, there are two ways to sort universities or shortlist universities. And the first one is uh, just uh, identify the university that you want to go to. It could be a very top ranked university or it could be any other university, which uh, whatever for whatever reason you might want to get into. And another one would be uh, apply to universities based on your profile. And when I say profile, I mean your undergrad CGPA, your years of work experience, your GMAT or GRE score and your extracurricular activities. So universities in US have like a holistic approach to admission and they look into all of this. Uh, and the way to get a scholarship or find universities which provide a scholarship would be uh, use some ranking. So one of the ranking is US news ranking and see universities on that rank and see which universities provide assistantship. So you will have to go to their website and uh, search for funding page or uh, tuition page and see if they actually have a scholarship or not. And then when you find some universities that actually have a scholarship, what do you do next? That is look at the average class profile hmm. and try to find universities where your profile is above average. If a university is providing a scholarship, it's more likely that they will give it to students who will have above average class profile. Oh yeah, that, that totally makes sense. They can't just give a scholarship to everyone. So obviously like the best in the class would get the scholarship. So my next question is about this scholarship. Like how does it work? You apply to the universities with 100% scholarship and then they just, you know, have you study on their campus without any fees or do you have to work there as a teaching assistant or research assistant? Or any other job okay so before i uh, go into that uh, what i'd like to mention is that the way to apply for a scholarship so there are several ways one would be during your application process you will just mention that if you are interested in a scholarship or assistantship you would say yes and in some some other universities you would apply get admission and then they will ask you or show you open positions uh, when I say open positions, these are assistantship positions. And then what that means is that you will apply to those jobs. And these jobs are usually 20 hours per week. You will be working for a university department or for a professor and help them in some administrative task or some research task. And uh, in uh, return of that, you will get your tuition waived and you will also get a monthly stipend for your expenses. Uh, one thing to note here is that when I say tuition, it's almost uh, 80 to 85 percent of the money that you will pay to the universities. You will still have to pay fees, which would be around 20 to 15 percent of your total uh, expenses. So basically what I understood is so there is a total amount that you are supposed to pay to your university in a semester and you are saying that 85% of that is waived and you have to pay the 15% amount but you can also use that stipend money to pay the remaining fees. Yeah that's right so from the stipend you can actually pay for your living expenses and also pay your uh, rest of the semester fees or the rest of the fees that you are supposed to pay. So guys like from what I am understanding is that it's not even a 100% scholarship. It's like 110 or 120% scholarship because uh, you are getting a monthly stipend that you can use to basically cover your living expenses such as your rent, expenses for food and groceries, etc. So my next question is about your degree. 
uh, what was your degree in and which college did you go to here in US? So I went to Oklahoma State University. So did you. Okay. Uh, and I studied uh, initially I came for MBA and my concentration was marketing analytics. But when I was uh, studying marketing analytics, I got more interested into analytics and I decided to pursue a second degree or dual degree along with MBA uh, in business analytics. And I completed both uh, MBA and MS in business analytics in uh, six semesters. Yep. And guys, that's how we met. So he was basically uh, an MBA student. And when he decided to get a dual degree in business analytics, uh, since I was getting my master's in business analytics, that's how we met and became friends. So my next question is about your job. What is your position? What kind of company is it that you are working for? And how did you get this job? I'm working as a data scientist in, at one of the largest uh, private companies in US. And this company is in manufacturing. And in my role as a data scientist, I actually work on uh, building and deploying model into production. Uh, doing some predictive analytics in predictive uh, maintenance and also some forecasting model for forecasting price and forecasting demands and also do on some analytics projects where uh, I build the KPIs and determine the KPIs and develop dashboards to report those KPIs. And I actually got this offer even before I graduated. So I did an internship with the same company uh, the summer prior uh, my graduation and that from that internship, I actually uh, got the full-time offer. So I actually had this uh, full-time offer even like almost uh, a year before I graduated. If you perform well in your summer internship, I see like a lot of companies, they will give you an offer right after you complete your summer internship. I think that was the case with you and with a lot of our classmates. My next question, since you said that you are working as a data scientist, so why did you choose data science? Since you also have an MBA degree, you could have worked as a consultant or maybe a product manager. As I mentioned before, I was doing uh, my concentration for MBA in marketing analytics and I got actually more interested in business analytics. And business analytics actually largely in our program in particular, it's also predictive uh, analytics or uh, data science as well. So that actually made me interested in data science. And another reason is every day is a new day for me. The project that I am working today and the project I'll be working tomorrow would be completely different. So I like working on uh, different and new things every day. Next question is about the degree. So basically, uh, do you need to have a specific degree in order to become a data scientist or take some online course and become a data scientist? As people say, US is the land of opportunity. You can be anything you want. So I have seen lots of uh, data scientists who don't have any formal education in data science, but who are self-taught. They are really interested in this field and explore different topics, learn by themselves and became data scientists. I have also seen uh, lots of uh, professionals who come from software engineering background and I have also seen lots of um, people who come from uh, formal education uh, like I did since I did not have the technical background this master's program actually really helped me to prepare for that. And I totally agree I have seen people like who have a background in psychology I have seen them becoming a data scientist here. So before I end this video. Uh, any advice you would like to give to any aspiring data scientist? For example, what tools should they focus on? What kind of technologies that they should learn that may help them to land a job as a data scientist? Uh, well, in terms of technical skills or technical knowledge, I think uh, knowledge of Python and SQL are very crucial for a data scientist because you would be using Python to do the modeling part as well as data manipulation and SQL for data retrieval. In addition to that, one of the cloud technologies like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or Google Colab would be really helpful because most of the companies are now moving into cloud and you would be using these to uh, deploy the models. And I hope if you are someone who is an aspiring data scientist, these tips would be helpful for you. If you have any questions for Imran, I will share his LinkedIn profile in the description. So thanks again, Imran, for coming on my channel. I am sure that uh, your journey will definitely help the aspiring data scientists and also the students who are looking for a 100% scholarship. 
Uh, thanks, Risha, for inviting me. Uh, it was uh, really uh, great to share my experience and also thanks for showing me uh, your city around.